Welcome to this uh, session uh, that will take us up to lunch break. And uh, it's just a continuation of the discussion that we've been having since yesterday. So the session that we are going to have uh, now will focus uh, on TB. So in the morning we've uh, had, we've listened to the uh, legal issues uh, around TB and HIV criminalization. Now we want to uh, understand a little bit about the science and how uh, this science can be used in reinforcing uh, our arguments, uh, in the uh, our legal arguments that we'll be having. So um, the session that we are going to have is basically a conversation. Um, do not be afraid that it will be a, a heavy science uh, lecture. It will be a conversation just to understand the basic issues about what is TB, what is the risk factor around TB, um, what are the, how, how is TB treated, and, and all those issues. And the intention of getting to know uh, these issues around the science, it will also just be able to help us now in case we are dealing with, um, with criminal issues or civil issues, then how can the science be used to show liability, culpability, and uh, to, to, to be able to, 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 pro to protect people with TB. So with the panel that we are having um, with me now, we have our own Colleen, as usual, who needs no introduction, uh, who, will, who is with Dr. Boyle, who will, uh, and they will take us through a little bit on the science, just share with us the basic facts, uh, some of the contentious issues, and we'll be applying our legal minds just to understand how all these fit into our uh, arguments and reinforcing the, uh, our arguments against TB criminalization. So thank you very much. And um, for this session, I will be a little, I will uh, solve or I will be able to deal with some of the injustices that Alan has uh, created. I will allow those who like to speak to ask questions. So pr please prepare your questions. I will allow everybody to answer, to ask questions around the science on TB. So Dr. Boyles, thank Welcome. Great. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Tom Boyles. I'm I'm the clinician, I'm the guy who uh, makes the diagnosis, prescribes the drugs, deals with the side effects, um, that kind of thing. I'm not a lawyer, my wife's a lawyer, she would have been great here today actually. Um, she knows almost as much as me about TB and HIV and is a lawyer. Um, I'm also not a trained ethicist, but all doctors are involved in ethics and I think um, you know, I'm, a, I'm trained to the level of a doctor in ethics. Um, what I'm going to do is just give you a very ba um, what I would say is a basic outline of what TB is, how we diagnose it, how we treat it, how it's transmitted, and a few uh, slides at the end just about how I, th how I would imagine, I'm guessing really, TB interacts with the law. Um, this is what was asked of me. These are the sort of questions that were put to me when I was asked to put together this talk. I can't speak to all of them. Um, what is TB? How is it treated? What is TB risk? I can talk to you about that. Can we hold people liable for transmission? I can't answer that question. That's a question for you, but we can discuss it in the question and answer session. And what role does isolation play in treatment? We can, uh, we can discuss that. The answer is um, nothing in, for, in treatment, but in terms of preventing transmission, that's a different question. So here are some real basics on TB. Apologies to you who know all of this. I think you've heard the epidemiology. You know how many people have got TB in the world. You know how many people die, so I won't go into that anymore. But TB is a, it's a bacteria. I've heard a few sitting at the back. I heard a few people talking about viruses and bacteria and getting them confused. Um, Ebola is a virus. HIV is a virus. These are tiny little things which live inside cells. Um, TB is a bacteria. And if you look at the, uh, the, the red things on the picture on the left, you can see all the yellow stuff, that's all sort of debris. But those red things, those little rod-shaped things, that's TB. Um, it's a bacteria with uh, this waxy coated cell wall which picks up these stains. So what's happened there is that somebody's produced a, a sample of sputum. It's been stained in a lab and it's been looked at under a microscope. 
and somebody can see these um, very characteristic red things. And this is one, uh, this has uh, been alluded to, this is what, uh, what's called smear microscopy, and this ha has been one of the mainstays of diagnosing TB since this uh, bacteria was discovered in the late 1880s. Um, we use it less and less now, this method, but um, because it's so characteristic, basically, you can look down the microscope, see this, and if they're there, then more or less you can say the person has TB. There are always caveats, but... Let's just say if you've got those there, then you've got TB. Picture on the right is also TB. This is what TB looks like if you grow it in a lab. So the, uh, there's a test tubes and those yellow things on the right-hand side, that's also TB. And TB um, takes a long time to grow. So one of the reasons it takes so long to kill. You might ask yourself why you take antibiotics for five days for pneumonia, but maybe 20 months for TB. And it's difficult to kill uh, because it grows slowly. And those test tubes on the right have been growing for about six weeks to get to that stage. So this is the other mainstay of diagnosis throughout the 20th century, and also today, is, is um, if we can't see the TB on the, the test on the left, can we grow it in the test on the right? But waiting six weeks for a test result is not great. So we can talk a little bit more about testing, but um, there have been great strides in the last 15 years into improving testing. But that used to be, and, and to some extent still is, the, the best way of, of, of um, testing for TB is to put your specimen in one of those tubes on the right, wait six weeks, and see if something grows. So where is TB? You may have seen some of these slides before. This is a 2015 uh, map of the world, and the colors are a little bit strange, but um, the yellow colors are the most TB, and the blue colors are the least TB, and you can see that TB kind of maps income to some extent. Um, the poorest areas of the world have the most TB, are the most yellow. Um, North America, Europe, Australasia, mostly spared. But it's not just income, it's also HIV. If it was just income, then you might expect South Africa as an as a upper middle income country to be uh, less yellow than that. But it also mirrors um, HIV. If, if I showed you the same map for HIV, you'd see a hotspot in South Africa and Southern Africa. You'd also see a reasonable amount of HIV in North America. Um, but TB incidence is, is dependent on many factors that we'll come to, um, HIV being one of them, poverty being another. And where they, the two most overlap in sub-Saharan Africa is where you get the, the peaks of TB. This is an important concept. Um, what types of TB are there? So just to be clear, I've heard the these words used already, and I just want to make sure you're all clear on what, what they mean. We talk ab about two types of TB as a, as a clinician. We talk about latent TB, and we talk about active TB. So latent TB is what the current uh, latest data suggests 24% of the world have. So sort of approaching 2 million people have latent TB. Latent TB means you have been exposed to TB. You've breathed in those bugs that I showed you. They got into your lung. Your immune system is doing a great job, what it's designed to do. Your immune system has walled off that bacteria, and the bacteria is just sitting there in your lung doing nothing. Well, almost nothing. And you're happily going about your lives, um, and nothing's hap nothing bad is happening to you right now. And Looking around the room, I would probably I wouldn't be surprised if 50% if of the people in this room have latent TB. Wouldn't surprise me. People coming from Africa, where we've got a lot of TB. I'm a TB doctor, so undoubtedly I've got TB. I've been working in TB wards for 10 years in South Africa. Undoubtedly, I've, somewhere in here, there's a bug. Um, and some of you have got that. What happens, and, and like I said, 24% of the world have, has got that. And if you die with latent TB, the TB dies with you, and that's the end of the story. Nothing bad happens. However, if your immune system loses control of that bug, the bug starts to replicate, reproduce, and it causes you to become sick. And when you become sick, that's what we call active TB. There's a lot of science behind this, which is beyond the scope of this talk. And it's a kind of a spectrum where you go from latency to active TB. You don't just flick click your fingers and it just switches, but you move from latent into active TB, and when you have active TB, you're sick. And what causes you to move from latent to active? 
Well, it's usually something to do with the immune system. It can just be as you get older and your immune system senesces as you get older. Crucially, it can be HIV. That's the biggest driver, is that HIV cripples the immune system and it allows the TB to break out. But there are other factors like diabetes, anyone whose immune system is compromised because maybe they've had a kidney transplant or they're on some drugs that suppress the immune system, all sorts of things. And um, in terms of numbers, the sort of dogma is that in your lifetime, if you have a normal immune system and you have latent TB, about, you have about a 10% chance of progressing to active TB and a 90% chance of just dying with your TB if nothing happens to your immune system. But if you've got HIV, it becomes more like 10% per year rather than 10% per lifetime. So it's a dramatic increase if you've got, if you've got HIV. Um, and it's also a moderate increase if you've got diabetes and, and these other things. So that's active versus latent TB. And has anyone got any questions on that now, or should I just finish my talk? That makes sense. Go forward. Okay. Tra TB transmission. So one of the reasons we're here today, or I'm here talking to you, and you're talking about TB, is because it's transmitted. If TB wasn't transmitted, and what I mean by transmitted is it's transmitted from a person to a person. Okay? There are lots of illnesses that are not transmitted from a person to a person. Like, you know, we're not here talking about prostate cancer or breast cancer or you know, cardiovascular disease, although they may have some issues relevant to you in terms of stigma and access to treatment and things. Um, they don't have issues related to things like incarceration, which is one of the things I'm sure you're very interested in. Um, and there are lots of infectious diseases which are transmitted but not person to person. We're not talking about malaria. Malaria, you need a mosquito. A person can't give, basically, there's, all, there's, all, there's never a never in medicine. I don't know about law, but there's never a never. But basically, a person can never give malaria to another person, but a person can give TB to another person. How do they do it? Well, only really one way. And it's coughing, sneezing, laughing, singing, shouting, anything like this picture suggests, which gets the bug, which is sitting in the lung of the sick person. So this is not the latent, this is not the person with latent TB. That TB is all walled off, safe and sound. It's the sick person with active TB, where they've got lots of these uh, bacteria in their lungs. They uh, expel these into the air through one of these mechanisms, coughing, laughing, singing, mostly coughing. And they sit in the air. I think it's important to realize that uh, although you can see these large particles on this picture, the particles that they're in are very small. They're smaller than you can see. And they hang around in the air at about this level, the level that you breathe it in, for sort of four, four hours or so. So if somebody had coughed in this room, somebody was cleaning the room before you got in, and they coughed, and four hours later, it's lunchtime, TB is still sitting there in the air for one of us to breathe it in. So that's how transmission happens. Um, the next stage of the cycle is that somebody breathes it in, gets into their lungs. As I've said, you get it. Some people will, most people will develop latent TB in the sense that the TB will just sit in their lung. Some people will develop active TB quite early. That, happen, that does happen, and that's quite important for sort of the incarceration thing. Some people will. Um, not have a long period of latency, but actually become get active TB very quickly. And other people will have active TB later al along the line. And like I said, if they get active TB, then they become this person with the sneezing, and that's the cycle. So if you want to think about how to stop transmission, you just need to think practically about this cycle. Right? How do we, what can we do to break this cycle? If, you, if you're in medical school or you're a doctor and you're doing exams and someone says, how do you stop TB transmission and you want to pass your exam, you say three things. You say administrative controls, environmental controls, and personal protective equipment. And by the time you've said that, you've passed your exam. If you want to get a gold star, you then add something to each of those le levels. Right? I'm sure in law it's the same. Right? It's pretty easy to pass exams. You just like, it's three buzzwords. So to pass medical exams, you say those three things at the top there. Administrative means, this is really about transmission around hospitals and other things. Administrative means try and stop the people with TB coming into anywhere near the people without TB. Because that's what you've got. It's this link between a TB person and non-TB person. So an administrative thing means put all the people who are TB, have got TB in one room and put all the people who don't have TB in another room and try not to let them mix together. 
And that's a sensible thing to do. It's not, I don't think that's, um, I don't think it's offensive to do that, although you can talk about stigma and other things. But um, you try and make sure people are in different parts of your hospital. Environmental means try and, what doesn't this bug like that's sitting in the air? There's a few things it doesn't like. One thing it doesn't like is, is fresh air, is wind. Because if you've got a, if you have a hurricane going through this room, those particles will be dispersed and they'll disappear and you won't breathe them in. So fresh air is great. So open windows, if you're in a warm enough country, people sitting outside where there's a wind blowing, that kind of thing. Um, other, things that, other things the bugs don't like is ultraviolet light, which, which is sunlight. So um, the other, that's another great thing about being outside is that ultraviolet light will kill these bugs in the air before they get into other people. Um, and you can put lights in the ceilings and you can do other things. So various environmental things. And then personal protective equipment, that really means masks. So you can imagine how do you break this cycle. You, the last picture, that guy was sneezing out all that stuff. If he puts a mask on, a very simple mask, a cheap surgical mask that, you see, that you've seen surgeons wear in the movies, just a cloth, piece of cloth, that will catch those great big particles as they come out of his mouth and nose. And that will prevent these particles forming. If you're the person without TB, you need a slightly different mask. You need an expensive mask, about 50 rand. It's called an N95 mask because those things, as I said, are tiny. And a piece of cloth um, won't trap those particles. They'll just go straight through. So it's no good having one of those surgical masks. You need, a, you need an expensive filtered mask. Um, I don't have one with me. It costs about 50 rand. And if you wear one of those, when you breathe in, the TB will be filtered and, and stop the TB going through. So those are the three sort of things that you talk about in, in your exam. But the other things, of course, are can we stop the person actually getting TB in the first place, the one who's going to do the coughing? So, um, or once they, well, let's say the top one is curative. Once somebody's got TB, we need to obviously get them on treatment as quickly as possible because when you get people onto treatment, the number of bugs in their sputum drops quite fast, depending on what you're treating them with and exactly what they've got. So you get people on treatment, get the bugs, kill the bugs in the sputum, so when they cough, there's less bugs in the sputum. That means less likely someone will breathe it in. Preventive treatment, I've heard people talk about. Let's try and prevent people getting TB in the first place, active TB. How do we do that? One way is to treat latent TB. Haven't dis we'll discuss that. Maybe we'll just discuss that now, treating latent TB. So I told you about half of us in the room have got this TB inside us. Maybe we'll be fine and nothing will happen. But we can take treatment now, which will essentially kill, sterilize the TB in our lungs, and so that if, even if our immune system does wane, or we get HIV or whatever, then we don't develop active TB. So that's a way of preventing cases, but also preventing transmission. We can also treat the conditions that weaken the immune system, again, to prevent more cases. We treat the HIV, the immune system stays healthy, people don't get active disease. Treat the diabetes, same thing. So transmission you can, is pretty easy. If you, know, if you understand that concept, you've just got to think about how and where we can break this chain between the active TB person and the non-TB person and the sputum, which goes from one to the other. OK, testing for TB is, is, a, is a, week long, a week of lectures, not, a, not a one slide. Um, it's the area that I'm most interested in. Um, and it's difficult to summarize it in five minutes. But the basics are that if you, well, the basics of diagnosing anything in medicine is the first thing you do is you talk to somebody, the next thing you do is you lay your hands on them, and the third thing you do is you take some, t take some test. So people, the thing that people forget about TB, the WHO are great at forgetting this, is that actually you, you start off by talking to somebody. Right? I mean, it's not rocket science. You, you ask them four questions. Are you coughing? Have you got weight loss? Have you got night sweats? Are you losing weight? You ask them those four questions. If they say no, 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 the chance they've got TB is it's really small. So you can say, okay, you can get rid of all those people. If they say yes, cough, fever, night sweats, weight loss, then you might be in business. So that's how you start. So symptoms can help. You can examine people, um, listen to their lungs. That can help a little bit. There are other things, because TB, what, the thing I didn't say at the very beginning, sorry, I forgot this, is to say that TB can affect any part of your body. I don't think there's any part of the body that's never had TB your big toe, um, anything. You know, we talk, think about TB being in the lungs, and it's the people with TB in the lungs that transmit, 
But you get TB in the brain, you get TB in the eye, you get TB in the liver, um, TB in the genitals, TB everywhere. Um, I once saw a patient who had excessive lacrimation, tears. He had, he had tears running down his face all day long, and his, his tear ducts were blocked. And then when they did a clever operation to take out a piece of his tear duct, they put it on a, in one of those test tubes I showed you, and it grew TB. This man had TB of the tear duct. I mean, there's no way that there's no TB. So um, examination, examining people can help. But then what everyone wants to talk about is the, is the tests. Um, WHO in particular love talking about tests. Um, you don't always need tests. Um, if, you're, if you've seen as much TB as people like me have seen, then you can quite often diagnose TB without, without really resorting to tests. But if you're less experienced, which most of the world is, then t tests can be helpful. Generally, you want to get a specimen. Sputum is, good, is a good specimen. If you can get it, you might have to get someone to breathe into some salty water to get this, the sputum out of their chest. Um, you might take some fluid from their spinal cord if you think they've got TB in their, in their brain. You might take some fluid from their abdomen if you think they've got TB in their abdomen, whatever, and you're going to do a test on it. I showed you the two tests. One is look at it down a microscope and see if you can see the bugs. That has limitations. Um, it has some advantages. Firstly, it's pretty cheap. It's pretty easy. You need a, you need a, a few reagents, some microscope slides, a, a microscope with a light source, which means often electricity, someone with a little bit of skill, but it's reasonably easy. But the problem is often there aren't enough bugs in your specimen to actually see any. So you can look you know, for half an hour at your specimen and not see any bugs, but that doesn't mean the person hasn't got TB. It's just the limitation of the test. You can do the other test I said, which is culture, which you can take that specimen, you can put it in that culture tube, but you have to wait. And that will, if there's just one bug in there, then, well, not one. If there's 10 bugs in there, then they'll, they will probably grow in your specimen. 10 is not a large number. I'm talking about millions and millions of, of bugs in the lung. But it takes six weeks, and your patient might be dead in six weeks, so that's a problem. So in the last sort of 15 years, mostly the last 10 years, there have been lots of new tests coming along. The, the picture on the right is something called a gene expert machine. WHO fall in love with this machine. Um, you can take a specimen, put it in this machine, run it, press go, wait two hours, pops out a result which says TB or no TB. And it's, it's pretty good. It's not brilliant. It's not as good as some people think it is. It's pretty good. It can still say no TB when there was TB there. And it can still say TB is there when it isn't there, actually, interestingly. So it's not perfect. But it's OK. Um, a lot of money's been spent on it. It's been rolled out worldwide. Um, I use it sometimes. Um, it, it is important, but it, it has been overstated to some extent, I think. And there are other tests. There are tests in urine. And there are a gazillion tests, people out there trying to crack this problem of diagnosing TB. There's all these companies out there with this, oh, I've got this brilliant test. Usually they're not that brilliant, but there is movement. Hmm? Most of the tests are not that brilliant. But anyway, TB testing is a, is a big topic, um, fraught with difficulties, but there has been some movement in the right direction. So that's testing for TB. What about treatment? So um, I think this is probably key probably spend, spend about 10 minutes talking to you about treatment, how TB is treated, in case you're not clear. This is a timeline of TB drugs. So prior to 1948, basically there were no drugs. Everyone died. You, the history of TB, I think, is not something to go into now, but it's absolutely fascinating. Dozens of famous people died of TB over the years, operas, everything uh, about TB. Um, and before 1943, um, there was no active treatment, and actually still about kind of a third, 20% to 30% of people survived TB. And there were things that helped. They went to the mountains, they uh, took fresh air, they got vitamin D. It kind of pushed it slightly in their favor. But um, you had a kind of 20 to 30% chance of surviving TB um, before this came along. And then streptomycin was discovered. I think George Orwell actually was one of the first people to get streptomycin, and he was allergic to it, and uh, it was, had a terrible time, and he died in 1949. And then you can see as, as the time went on, lots of drugs came along, which uh, showed 
potential usefulness. Isoniazid in 1952, which we use today. Pyrazinamide in 1954, we use today. Thambutol in 1961. And then crucially in 1963, rifampicin, which is a mainstay of treatment today. And so TB treatment did well, uh, did well. And then there was a hiatus from 1963. Um, and the next drug that comes along is not till 1976. And then most of these drugs here, they weren't developed for TB. They were developed for other reasons, usually for standard bacterial infections, amicacin, ofloxacin, gatifloxacin, linezolid. They were, they, were, they were for treating standard bacterial infections, but they were shown to have benefit in TB. And so they started being used. Rifapentine is really just a copy of rifampicin. Um, so nothing much happened really from the, the 60s through to the 2000s. And that, we'll explain why that was a problem. But then something, something really quite encouraging has happened since then in the last, well, in terms of, of people actually getting the tablets to swallow really only the last five years, three to five years. But the drugs being registered, there's one called PA824, which has got a, a real name, Pretominid. Then 2005, Bedaquiline. 2006, Delaminid. So those three drugs, they were sp this was the result of careful scientific work where people looked hard to see what are the targets inside a TB bug we might be able to kill. And I'll, I'll show you how, how that process works. But basically, they were, they were absolutely looking for a drug to treat TB, and they came up with the drugs, and there's three that are registered now, three new ones. And they have made a, a, a big impact. This is what, a, just, just to explain what a TB drug pipeline looks like. And this is what, this was uh, just, just 2006. So this is kind of what the pipeline looked like in 2006. And it's, you know, it slightly moves to the right the whole time. But you begin with discovery. So this is, these are the dedicated people working in labs, working on these bugs, trying to work out how all the enzymes work and everything, trying to work out which thing can we maybe knock out which will kill this bug? And you can see there's a whole bunch of um, targets. And then you, get, then you get the drug, and you, do, you develop a drug that might knock out one of those targets. And then you do toxicity assessment. That's like you just basically give lots of it to lots of animals in high doses and see how many die. And if not too many die, then you move to phase one, which is where you give it to healthy people. So you take this new compound, you give it to healthy people to make sure they don't die. And then in phase two, you move on and you start giving it to people with the illness, but in relatively small numbers, just to get an idea of what dose you might need to use. Um, that's phase two. And then phase three, at the end, this is where you do the big trial, where you get people with TB and you give half of them one drug and half of them another drug, and you see who does best. And at the end of phase three, then you've got this drug, which uh, you hope is going to work. Because of the pressures on of, of TB, normally you would wait until after the phase three studies were done. So this whole process is, is um, 10 to 15 years. Normally you would wait to the end of phase three before you started giving, handing out these drugs, but because of the pressures of, of drug-resistant TB, um, things have been fast-tracked. And so you can see on the right-hand side, you've got um, things like bedaquilin, which I mentioned, protominid, delaminid, all in phase three studies, but actually already being used. Um, importantly being used um, um, because we, the, the need was so great and the benefits that we saw in the phase two trials were kind of enough that they've been pushed out into use before the phase three trials and I think that's appropriate but a point for debate. So this is looking relatively healthy. If you compare this, my other world is, is normal bacteria, um, superbugs that you hear about on the news. Um, the pipeline in Antibiotics for superbugs is bare right, in, in hospitals. So there's nothing on it, basically. I mean, there are a few things on the left-hand side, but there's very little on the right-hand side. The TB pipeline actually looks relatively strong. Um, and so it's, there's hope in the TB treatment world. The HIV treatment world is driven by rich people in America. I mean, thank goodness rich people in America got HIV. I mean, if they hadn't, poor people in Africa would be screwed. Let's be honest about that. I mean, it's a godsend that rich people got HIV. The problem is rich people don't get TB, and that's one of the reasons why we've been so far behind. I mean, it's starting to work now, but we're so far behind because rich people just don't get TB, basically. I mean, I've said to, this, I said to the guy at the NIH, whatever you do, don't make a really expensive cure for TB. HIV, I mean. 
If you make a really expensive cure for HIV, you're going to give it to all your rich friends. They'll all get cured, and then all the money flowing into TB drug development, HIV drug development will disappear, and everywhere in Africa will be in big trouble. If you're going to make a cure for HIV, make it cheap, make it accessible. If you make it expensive and inaccessible, then African people are in big trouble. So um, TB is going pretty well. Let's move on to, to treatment. This is standard treatment. So the, I'm going to talk about drug-sensitive TB and drug-resistant TB. I'm going to explain It's basically what it says on the tin. Drug-sensitive TB means that all the drugs work. And I showed you that list of drugs. So if you've got drug-sensitive TB, pretty much every drug, well, actually, every drug on that list I showed you, and it's a long list, works. It's the same TB that George Orwell had and all the people behind him before antibiotics came along. Um, that's what they've got, and all the drugs work. And that's the majority of people, depending which country you're in. But if you're in South Africa, for instance, um, well over 90% of people still have this drug-sensitive TB. And um, there've been over the years, there have been many iterations of which of that long line of drugs to use. Not the ones, the very recent ones, but because we've been using this standard treatment for a while now, but various combinations have been tried and we've settled on this regimen where you take those four drugs there, you put them in a tablet, those pink tablets, that pink tablet's got all four drugs in it. You take a number of those tablets, depending how much you weigh, two, three, four, or five of those tablets, for two months. And then there's another tablet where you drop the two drugs below, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and for the next four months, you take a tablet with the two drugs at the top, rifampicin, niacin, and that's six months. So two months of four drugs, four months of two drugs. And if you take those tablets, if you've got drug-sensitive TB and you take those tablets, um, you will have a 95% chance of being cured. Quickly, you will become uninfectious. Um, in, in a couple of weeks, you'll cease to be infectious, which is important in terms of transmission. And then, but you need to carry on for the six months, and your chance of relapsing or not being cured is only about 5% if you take them well. Of course, not everybody takes them well. But, um, so, and that is the majority of TB. That is, that is over 90% of TB in a country like South Africa. In Eastern Europe, it's not, it's not 90% of people. We can discuss that. So, not that controversial. The drugs, we'll talk about side effects. This is not the, you know, six months is a long time. Um, these drugs have side effects. It's not great, but it's not terrible. It, and it works. I think what's much more interesting to you, probably, um, as lawyers, is drug-resistant TB. And this is when some of those drugs on that list that I showed you start dropping off your menu. And they, what I mean by that is, if you give the person that drug, it just, wasn't, it just won't work. It has no effect on it. It's as if the drug didn't exist. And what we call multi-drug resistant TB, MDRTB, is when those two drugs at the top, the two most important ones, rifampicin, niacin, niacin, don't work. And that's the definition. There is no other definition. If, you, if you're resistant to both, you've got MDR. If you're sensitive to either one of them, you don't. That's the end of it. You can have any pattern of resistance. You can have, be resistant to three of these and not to the rest or whatever. Any pattern can exist, but the common pattern is being resistant to those two drugs, the best drugs that we've got, essentially, or have had until recently. And if you're resistant to those, you've got MDR. And then you're in trouble because they're the best drugs. And now, suddenly, although there's that list of drugs available to you, and they do work a little bit, they, they work less well. So a few things start to happen. Firstly, the drugs look, work less well. Secondly, they become more expensive. Thirdly, they become more toxic. And because of the first one, they work less well, you have to take them for longer. And this becomes kind of catastrophic. So things have evolved over time. The treatment for multidrug resistant TB has evolved over time, and it changes. It, um, it changed, actually, in 2016 to this regimen, which is those drugs below, um, which you have to take for nine months. Before, a couple of years ago, you had to take them for 18 months. And if you look at this picture here, this is the kind of handful of drugs you'd have to take every morning something like that, um, and plus the injection. That's an injection in your bottom every day for six months. And these people are thin, and they don't have much bottom. Right? They've, got, they've got skin and they've got bone, but no bottom. 
and you have to be injected in the bum every day for six months. Even with the current regimen, where we've, we've reduced the whole thing from 18 to nine months, you still have got this injection, canamycin, for um, four or five months every day in your bum, and it's sore. It's really sore. No wonder people hate it. So that's how you treat MDR-TB. Like I said, we've moved forward. Things are a little bit better now than they were three years ago. Um, but you still have got these injections, and you've got terrible side effects. Okay, you've got expense, you've got length of treatment, you've got side effects. One of the worst, if you talk to people who've, who've taken this, is nausea. Some of those drugs just make you sick. And literally, people, they, you've got that handful of drugs, you've got to get them into you. You feel terrible, you take them, they make you sick, you vomit. Some people like, almost describe almost drinking their own vomit, almost. Like they're just trying to get these tablets into them. It's absolutely terrible. They make you deaf, that injection. Some people can go stone deaf overnight, lose all of their hearing for the rest of their life, gone. They give you neuropathy, pains in your feet, they affect your thyroid gland. These are not pleasant drugs to take. So that's MDRTB. Moving on XT to XDRTB. So again, there's a simple definition. If you're also resistant to canamycin and amoxifloxacin, these are your next two best drugs. Uh, or, 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 similar, or, or any ones in their family, plus the two at the top, then you've got XDRTB. So that means not only do your best two drugs not work, your next best two don't work either. And usually when you get to that stage, you've, those two in the middle, which kind of work a little bit, are also not working. So you kind of got six drugs that don't work. And until a few years ago, you were in massive trouble. So what I didn't say is the outcomes for MDR-TB, multidrug resistant TB, about 40% of people would survive that, which isn't that much better than the 20% who used to survive it in the old days. 60% um, of people would die with MDR-TB. With XDR-TB, it's basically as if there's no treatment. About 10% of people were surviving XDR-TB. And, and I'll, I'll come on to the good news, but about 10% of people were surviving. They had these terrible drugs, these drugs at the bottom, plus some recycled drugs and things from back in the 1950s. Um, everyone tried their best, but the treatment just didn't really work. Um, there have been, things have moved on in the last few years, and it's, this is a really important point. Um, the world has changed a bit, and you see those three drugs, or four drugs at the bottom of that list, which I've just added, linezolid, bedaclin, delaminid, pretominid. These, and clofazamine. Clofazamine is an old drug, which is um, actually shown to be pretty effective. And those ones below are actually pretty good, and because they've not been around for a long time, even if you've got this highly resistant XDRTB, it's likely that these will work, very likely that these will work. And the good news is there's a study in, uh, uh, initiated in Johannesburg using three of those drugs, linezolid, bedaclin, and protominid, given to these people who used to have a 10% survival and they now have an 80% survival, 8-0. This is new, this is kind of hot off the press, it's been presented in conferences in the last year, few years, um, but it's a, it's a big move. From a lawyer's point of view, the question is, can, is, is access to treatment. So we, we, we're getting good evidence that we can treat XDRTB, but can we get the right drugs to the right people? That's the right price. But we know we can treat it. And so there's actually this, this kind of odd situation now that if you've got drug-sensitive TB, you do quite well. If you've got XDRTB and you can get these drugs, you do okay. But actually the middle group are actually slightly worse off, the MDR group, which is an odd situation to be in. And we could discuss how that came about but the MDR are actually now lagging behind. That is if you can get access to these drugs. So I'm gonna finish off um, with a few things, just two or three slides on things that I thought might be of relevance to you as lawyers. This is XDR, what, happened to, what was happening with XDR like before what I just told you about, before this new three drug regimen? Um, and what was happening was people were being treated, and one thing that TB doesn't do in a hurry necessarily is kill you. If it, kill, if, if it was like Ebola virus, and you got Ebola virus, and you either survive or you die in a few days, then you haven't got that much chance to transmit it to somebody. I mean, obviously it's highly transmissible, Ebola virus, but a lot of these people with this XDRTB before the recent times were surviving for quite long periods. They'd be in hospital for two years taking these terrible drugs. It would be enough to keep them alive. The, TB was, the HIV was being treated, they were staying alive. But 
the TB wasn't being cured. They were still coughing up infectious material. And that's a terrible situation. You're in, you've got this person who's basically dying, but very slowly. They're in this terrible hospital. These hospitals are not nice places. They're having these terrible drugs, but it's not working. So that was a terrible situation, which hopefully we're moving away from. But there was a lot of discussion about that. And this is a, a, a study of 270 of these patients who've got um, programmatically incurable TB, is what that means. It's like you're giving them these drugs, they're just not doing it, they're just not working, but the patient's not dying. 172 of them went home. Okay, this is home often to a shack with lots of people in the room. I told you how transmission works. You can see that that's a nightmare. Um, most of them had very bad outcomes. They died eventually. But importantly, if you, if you want to discuss incarceration and keeping people away from their homes, and I'm intrinsically against that, but there are two sides to, to the story, um, they looked very closely at 90 of those patients and 17 people in their houses got this terrible illness, and 10 of them died. So because these people went home, at least 10 other people died of XTRTB, at least, probably more. So sending someone home under these circumstances does have its bad side. Um, and that's your family members dying of the disease that you've got. The other thing I thought you would be interested in as lawyers is access to treatment, which is very important, and we've, we've, we've covered this. This is an MSF poster saying that 81% of people with drug-resistant TB don't get effective treatment, and only half of those that do are cured. This is maybe slightly out of date, but access to treatment um, is, is uh, a very important issue. And the third one, um, in terms of all of those things really, access to treatment, um, transmission, and basic human rights is the prison population. This, I mean, this picture tells a story. I mean, I told you about how transmission works. Um, this is a prison cell, and they're not sure they look that different from this. There's no wind, there's no light. It's crammed full of people. They've got high levels of TB, high levels of HIV. Prison is an is absolute melting pot for TB transmission, and we know that happens, and we know that people in, in prisons are neglected, um, not screened, not treated, don't get their treatment when they get into prison. So um, if I was to engage a lawyer, I think I would, certainly be interested in, in how we help the prison population. And so that's all I've got to say. Um, I hope I've covered most of the points, but I'd, I'd prefer it to turn in more into discussion. I'm available to answer any questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Tom. Thanks very much for the insightful discussion. So I think we'll allow Colleen to quickly come in and lead the conversation around this. Thanks, Tom. That was um, an excellent overview. And I think, uh, so last night, yeah, sorry, <laughs> have a seat. Um, so yesterday in the afternoon, we actually got to a point where we were discussing transmission. Um, because we were talking about HIV and criminalization and the issues that uh, some of the cases that have been taken to court in terms of um, HIV uh, being transmitted to somebody else, and we actually spoke to um, a man who is in prison in Idaho in the US. Um, he's been in prison for 30 years because of um, he didn't disclose his um, status to uh, his partner at the time. And so these questions around transmission came up, and particularly with TB. And one of the things we were talking about is how, uh, and this is where I think it would be great if you can give us a little bit more information about how difficult it is to actually um, show that, uh, you know, I have TB and I infected everybody in the house and, and, and that kind of thing because we do do household uh, contact tracing. Um, and one of the things that we were talking about is that if it's in a prison, uh, here in Africa, Alan said that the standard is when someone goes into prison, everybody gets tested for uh, 
TB. So what that, that test in, uh, entails is what Tom was talking about. You ask the questions, have you had a fever in the past two weeks, unexplained weight loss, night sweats, um, coughing, and so on. Um, and then if people say yes to any of those, then they are actually, uh, a sputum sample is taken and you, you can actually see if they have TB or not. And so we were, think we were talking uh, a little bit about the Dudley Lee case, which we'll be going into more detail about tomorrow, where Dudley Lee actually um, uh, sued the prison system here in South Africa. You know about this one. And so where he said he acquired TB in prison. Um, but we were talking about direct causality. So Colleen has TB. Did I give it to Tim? Did I give it to you? And so if you could give us a little bit more information around that, um, that would be really wonderful. The other thing that I did want to um, mention, well, actually, no, you go ahead with, and, and talk about that, and, uh, and then we can move on to other questions. Okay, so I'd rather stand up if you don't mind. Um, so the question is, is, can you prove transmission? It's difficult in the HIV world. You, I know you put a session with Francois um, later on, t on HIV, so we won't go there. Francois, you're in for a treat. I, I'm really glad I'm not going after Francois. He's an incredibly good speaker, um, and he'll keep you entertained. Can you prove TB in transmission? Yes. Well, I showed you that, uh, that paper um, here, and I told you that um, 17 household contacts were infected by the patients who came to live with them, and 10 of them died. Um, they went to some lengths to prove that, so you could say, well, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, this person had XDRTB, the person in the house didn't, and then they got XDRTB, and so they must, they must be linked. But people go to greater lengths than that, and I, I'm sure from a lawyer point of view, you would want more, if you're going to prove something, you would want more data. So what you can do is take the samples from both the patients, the, the one who, the index patient, and the new patient, and you can do, you can sequence them, which means you can, you've heard of the Human Genome Project where you, you look at all the base pairs, you can do that for each of those bugs. And TB is constantly evolving. So um, what you do is you just see if they're, so w what I'm trying to say is one XDR is not the same as the next person's, which is not the same as the next person's. Okay, they're all slightly different. So you can, by doing expensive and complicated laboratory work, you can work out that the bug in the two patients is actually very, very similar. And it will be slightly different from the XDR that the guy down the road has got and the guy down the road. They'll all be slightly different, but the two people in the same house, they'll be the same. And that, again, I'm not a lawyer, so the level of legal, you know, what constitutes legal proof of transmission is something for you to discuss. But basically, that's, that's the way it would be done. Yeah, and with whole genome sequencing, um, we're actually seeing it being used in where we have outbreaks. So here in South Africa, when they had Tugela Ferry, and I think this is that example uh, up here. Is This is from Tugela Ferry, no? no? Uh, okay. Um, but yeah, so this is where we can do that. We had one in um, Switzerland when I was there where we actually did it over a period of time. Um, and so you are able to, to find out, my question, though, is if I am, um, if I go into a prison, for example, and I don't have TB when I get there, but I do have TB when I'm in the prison, and then others in the prison get TB, how do you know that it's actually me that transmitted it? They might have had latent TB infection that was activated. They might have had, um, they would, might have already had active TB disease, but we didn't see the symptoms yet. Um, and so will it take then genome sequencing in order to determine whether it was me that transmitted to others? So, so what genome sequencing can tell you is how related the species are to one another, the, the isolates are to one another, and you can do a whole tree, I, I, I don't have an image to show you, but you can, you can have a whole tree of these isolates, and you can show that, that they're related to one another, but you, it doesn't tell you in which order they were transmitted. So the only way to know, like in, in the study that I'm showing you, is that the, those 17 people, they, they were well until the person came home, and only later they developed disease, and that's a evidence that the transmission was in that direction. But if a whole bunch of people are in a melting pot in a prison cell, you can show that they have related um, strains of the, of the TB, 
but I don't believe you'd be able to tell unless you knew for sure one of them was well and became sick and the other one had previously, was previously sick. You wouldn't be able to tell the direction of transmission. Right. And so I think that's something that we really need to um, uh, consider. Um, Annabelle, actually, I do have a picture of what Tom was talking about. I'm, I'm sorry, again, with the... But, but that is an important factor to consider in terms of uh, that direct causality and the, the notion of I am giving Annabelle TB or Annabelle is giving me TB because it will be a challenge to be able to say that was direct, particularly with the mutations. So I just actually will, it's called TB transmission. Um, show you a quick picture of what um, Tom is talking about if it comes up. Right, so this is what Tom is talking about, and here I'm going to give it back to you, so you could just because I do. This was the issue yesterday that we were really getting into a lot of discussion about, and I think this is a great picture that will show you how challenging that can be in order to have that direct causality. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think in this picture you're looking at um, what are thought to be index cases, but as the colors change, then the, the bug is changing slightly. Um, and I, I think what they're doing is um, suggesting that this is an index patient who's transmitted to these people, but normally what it means is um, a change in color is the, a change in sequence and then distance, is that time? Is that the time? So the, the length of the line is time. And so you can put together this presumed um, cluster because you can see that these are all, got, are all purple, those are mostly green and then mostly blue and mostly pink. Um, and by looking at time, you can make assumptions about who transmitted to who. If one person was p perfectly well, comes into contact with a sixth person and then gets sick, then if you know that to be true, then you can, you can infer the direction of, of transmission. Um, but I think in a, in a sort of prison situation, that would be pretty hard. Yep. Um, and so, I, do we have any questions at this time around transmission in, in terms of what we've discussed right here? Uh, because I do, I do also want to um, pick Tom's brains a little more about some of the, he did a great job in showing you what some of the really, um, uh, the newer treatment regimens are and what people should be able to expect when they go um, to a doctor. Uh, and. Do we first want to ask any transmission questions? We do. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to take the gentleman right there. So you're first. There was a hand back there. Richard and that gentleman and then Annabelle last. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Tapelo. I'm from Botswana. Um, the question I have is regarding active TB. Is it necessarily infectious or it could be non-infectious. Also the question then goes to um, active TB and latent TB to say um, the links between the two. Um, I think we talk a lot about infection and we don't necessarily make a reference as to whether it's latent TB or active TB. Because I am thinking that if you have latent TB and you get in contact with someone who has infectious TB, what are the linkages between the two? Or to say, what is the relationship between the two and um, one actually yeah. inevitably having the immune system compromised? Should I just answer those that go? Can I, or do you want to take them all? We might take them all. Okay, I'll just yeah. write them down then. Yep. <laughs> Can I just answer that? Yeah, answer, answer that, exactly. It might. Um, so your first question was, um, is about infectiousness of people with active TB, I think. So you can have TB and be, you can have TB disease and be non-infectious because to be infectious, you have to be producing something out of your lungs. So if you've got TB meningitis, TB in your brain, and your, t and your lungs are clear, and which can happen, although the TB got in through your lungs in the first place, for reasons which are hard to explain, it's actually only causing disease in your brain, you, are not, you cannot transmit it to somebody else. Um, yeah, it's true with TB anywhere outside of the lungs. Mm -hmm. So you have to have, to transmit, you have to have TB in the lungs. Um, the question then is, is, are there grades of how infectious you are? And the answer is yes. So I showed you that picture at the beginning uh, of the, the yellow slide with the, with the TB bacilli in them, the, the, the red rods. 
So what we do is we actually we, we look at those samples and we grade them. It might be that you look at a sample and you can just sort of see one of them, or you might see a bunch, or you might see a huge number. And actually, we know that by doing that test on somebody, that is predictive of how likely they are to transmit to somebody. And that kind of makes sense. That if your sputum has got a few, only a few bugs in it, the chance that enough are going to get it into the next person to infect them is less than if your sputum is teeming with bugs. Um, and so that we use that to measure how transmissible, how infectious you are. And we also track that while you're on treatment. So you might start off and you might be a 3 plus, that's the maximum. You might be a 3 plus, and then after two weeks you might be a 1 plus. And then after another two weeks you might be negative. And we know that your risk to other people is dropping the whole time as you're going through that process. So I hope that, that kind of explains transmission. Um, I think your, the question you are kind of asking was, if you've got latent TB, can you get infected? This is what I th I'm trying to drill down to what you meant was, can you get infected by an active person with active TB if you've already got latent TB? Is that kind of what you were saying? I think the answer to that is undoubtedly yes. yes. Um, if you think about TB, TB is, this is the way I think about sort of the immunology basically around these sort of illnesses. There are some illnesses that you only get once. Okay, you only get measles once, basically. You get it, once you've got it, your immune system is primed. Any time in the future you see measles, it'll fight it off and you won't get it. Vaccination is the same as having it. That, that's measles. TB isn't like that. You can get TB over and over. So even having TB, which you think would be like the ultimate vaccine, so the ultimate vaccine is having, usually having the illness, isn't enough to protect you from having TB again. So your body does not produce a, um, a, a enough of immune response to prevent you getting it a second time. So just because you've got latent TB in, inside you does not mean that when you breathe in the next TB bug from someone else, it'll, it'll just get zapped. It won't happen. So um, you can get, undoubtedly, you can get infected, even if you've got latent TB. Is it, was that your question, essentially? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we'll go to the back. Patrick Joubert. The lady with the lipstick. Uh, this one? Uh, yes, in the middle, middle table right okay. here, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'll just <laughs> ask about transmission, because this is my first time um, learning about TB and I work with prisoners, so I'm really interested in this issue. So the first question that I had is in relation to my drug-resistant TB. Uh, I wanted to know how infectious a person with uh, my drug-resistant TB is, how infectious they are, uh, looking in their prison setup, and at what point do they stop being infectious? Because you mentioned that in <clears throat> normal cases, within two weeks, a person after taking drugs, they can stop being infectious, but in terms of my drug-resistant TB, how long does it take? And uh, if a person has my drug-resistant TB, how dangerous are they to the prison population? Should they be in prison or they have to be outlined out because of the risk? Thank you. Okay, so the answer is that as far as we know, and it's a little bit controversial, whether your TB is sensitive to the drugs, multi-drug XDR, MDR, XDR, um, the actual, the intrinsic nature of the bug is not essentially more or less infectious. So whether you're sensitive or resistant, they're equally infectious pretty much. There's been some debate about that, mm. about whether maybe some of the drug-resistant ones are actually more, more transmissible. But my reading on it is that it's not, although it's not easy to tell, probably they're equally so. The differences with drug resistance, well, firstly, the, the, the factors which we just discussed all apply. So if I look in your, if, it, if it's not in your sputum, you're not infectious. I mean, if you don't have TB in your lungs. If I look in your sputum and I can see lots of bugs, you're more infectious. Less bugs, less infectious. So that all applies. The difference really with drug resistance is how long it takes to go from lots of bugs in your sputum down to not very many. And um, again, there's, people debate this, and it's not... It's difficult to study. Like, it's not that straightforward to study. Um, and I've said that in two weeks, somebody with drug-sensitive TB becomes uninfectious. It's probably less than that. It's probably a few days, actually. You, you, you get this massive drop-off in bugs in the first few days. And so, um, it's, you know, two weeks is a figure which is sort of thrown out there without great evidence. But with, when the drugs are working less well, then it's safe to assume that it takes longer than a few days. Exactly how long that takes is difficult to say. Um, 
but it probably stretches into the few weeks to the to months maybe for for MDRTB and XDRTB in the old days, as I described to you, those people had been on treatment for two years, and they were still infecting people because the drugs basically didn't do anything. So um, it's it's multifactorial, but the better the drugs work the quicker the time to non-infectiousness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's range, ranges from a few days in sensitive TB up to years in TB where the drugs just don't work at all. But generally, it's probably measured in, in days to weeks. So, um, I'll just also get Tom to give you a little more information there. But So, Tom, when you have uh, drugs that are actually working, and you have drugs, uh, drug-resistant TB. What is the time frame from when you start the treatment to the first test to see if the drugs are working or not? So, um, when you have uh, drug-resistant TB, what we do is we take a sample of sputum every month from you. And we do those two tests that I showed you at the beginning. Actually, not the fancy new tests that I alluded to, but we the two tests at the beginning. We look down the microscope to see if we can see any. And usually, after a month, we can't. But we also do the culture. And what I was trying to get to you from the culture is that the culture can pick up a much smaller number of bugs than the microscope test. And so um, what we're looking for, we're taking a, a sample every month. And we're looking to get to the point where it no longer grows, where, where the culture the very sensitive test doesn't, doesn't grow anything. And so in a typical patient with, say, multi-drug resistant TB, that might take three or four months. So we know there is something in the sputum. It might be a small number, but there's something in the sputum for three or four months. And then after that, then there's very little. Um, in someone with drug sensitive TB, they might, they might, culture might become negative after, in the, at the first month, it might already be negative. In fact, we don't usually do that. In drug sensitive TB, we don't actually do that monthly test. We do it in drug resistant TB. So usually you'd expect people to be culture negative, i.e. really almost nothing in the sputum by like four months. Mm -hmm. Now the gentleman at the back. Patrick Gruber, journalist from the Seychelles. Which, which, uh, I want to get your view. Sorry, could you come a bit closer to the mic? Or Patrick pull it Gruber, closer to you? journalist from, from, from Seychelles. I would, I would like to get your view as a doctor. Is isolation of a TB patient a good practice or a, a bad practice? Um, okay, straightforward question. Is isolation of a patient a good place? Isolation is an extremely good idea. Um, if you're working in a, in a hospital, sorry, the man at the back. I'm not sure what. I don't think we have the question. They didn't hear the So the, the question is, is to me as a doctor, not as a lawyer, should we be isolating people with TB? So um, absolutely we should and we do everywhere in the world that we have the facilities that if somebody comes into the hospital and they're coughing up TB and it's got lots of the bugs in it, then everybody around them is at risk. And the ideal, solu the ideal solution to that, so long as they are sick enough to require hospital treatment, and I think this is probably where the key comes in, if you're sick enough that you have to be in hospital anyway, then that's a straightforward thing. If you have the facility, the resources, you put them in a room with negative pressure, everyone wears masks, you do the full the full protective uh, procedures and nobody gets infected with TB while the person needs to be in hospital anyway. So that's, that's straightforward. Like no, nobody has any qualms about an Ebola patient being put in isolation and everyone wearing white suits. Like everyone's happy with that. So that's not a problem. I think the questions, the ethical problems come in when the patient no longer needs to be in hospital for their own health. Um, such as the, pa the patients I showed you in the study who'd been in hospital for two years and the drugs weren't doing anything, so what's the point? They didn't need to be in hospital for their own health. That's when things become tricky, ethically and legally. But when, when you need to be in hospital anyway, it's a no-brainer. We do that, we do that all no. the time for all sorts of illnesses. Sorry, it was, it was the question in the corner there, and then it was Annabelle, and if we have time, we'll take this one. Okay, merci. Because he speaks French. Oh, he speaks French. I, I understand French. Je parle français un peu. Oui, je parle français. Oui, c'est Maître Serge. En fait, je voudrais avoir une précision euh, par rapport à la science. Est-ce qu'il suffit d'avoir un rapport d'un expert 
pour la réunion de tous les éléments infractionnels, je voudrais justement dire, est-ce que le juge peut recourir à l'acte matériel ou au rapport d'un expert par rapport à la transmission Est-ce que c'est suffisant Et si cela n'est pas suffisant, d'après tout ce que vous venez de, de donner comme exemple, euh, 10 personnes ont été atteintes, est-ce qu'il est possible aujourd'hui que le juge se réfère à l'acte matériel par rapport à la transmission Est-ce que c'est suffisant à ce niveau-là Je voudrais avoir concrètement des précisions par rapport à la transmission. Est-ce que c'est suffisant Basically, he's asking, with the 10 people that you gave the example for, is that enough to take to a judge to get a judgment that says those people were infected by somebody else? That's a, that's a question for a lawyer, not for a doctor. Okay, this is, that's, about, that is, that's a lawyer question. What, what level of evidence is required? What I can tell you is that it seems pretty convincing. From a medical point of view, we would accept that. I would accept it as a doctor, but that's, you're talking about, about being a lawyer. So I, that, that's, a, that's a lawyer's question. So there's one person sick, the other one's not. This not sick person gets sick, and their bugs look the same when we do our clever tests. To me, that's enough. That's enough. But whether it's enough for a lawyer, a judge, is not for me to say. So Alan, I'm going to give you the floor to, to respond to that. So just real quickly, I think the test in this question if it's a criminal case, would be beyond reasonable doubt. So the judge would have to exercise in his mind or her mind, not having knowledge of these scientific things, whether that is sufficient proof that someone is criminally liable. Of course, if it's a civil case, then that's on a balance of probabilities, and it could go either way. But from my personal view, from a criminal point of beyond reasonable doubt, that would not be sufficient evidence to secure a conviction. But you have to take the context that you're probably dealing with a judge who has never seen this slide before, doesn't know which axis does what, and maybe, maybe convinced by the healthcare worker in terms of how the evidence has been adduced. So from a lawyer's perspective, Hopefully, if you're not working for the Attorney General, you need to figure out which expert witnesses do you bring, and if the government does bring expert witnesses, what line of cross-examination do you take to dispel the myth that that is not beyond a reasonable doubt? And I think this question will also come up in the conversation of HIV later this afternoon. Thanks, Alan. I'm actually just going to hold the questions from the room for just a moment because I think we have three from Facebook from the, the live feed. So we'll take those three questions and then we'll come back to, to you. And, and there are a lot more hands than when we first said. So I know Richard is waiting, you're waiting, and Annabelle is before the lunch. other hands. If you don't get it in in time, we'll talk over lunch. I'm exactly. Not in a hurry. But, so um, let's go to Facebook let's go to first. Facebook. Sure. We have a question from Takunda Manjonjo who says, what is the relationship between BCG vaccination and latent TB? Okay, so there's no, essentially no relationship. BCG is a, is a vaccine to prevent TB. It doesn't work very well. Okay, there's a whole, another whole week of lectures on TB vaccines. Basically, they don't work very well. BCG is a vaccine many of us have had, many of you will have had, um, my child has had it. It's quite good at preventing serious TB in kids. So you, you give it to kids at birth in this country, in many African countries, and it prevents you getting TB, or TB disease, actually. Um, but it doesn't pre prevent latent TB. Well, does it prevent latent TB? I don't know the answer to that. I actually don't know if it prevents latent TB. Um, I'm sorry, I just can't answer that. It probably does, um, but it probably does prevent latent TB. But it, what it does do is it prevents kids with TB getting really serious TB, like TB meningitis. Cool. Uh, we have a question from Tawanda who's in the room, so I'll skip that, and they can ask it <laughs> during lunch. We have another question from Easy James, who says, does one get the same type of TB as the carrier, e.g. XDR or DR, or could it be still latent despite being infected by one with an active TB? So you will get the TB of the person who coughed and you breathed it in. If they've got XDR-TB, you'll get XDR-TB. You might get latent XDR-TB. 
So you may not get the disease, but that bug sitting inside your chest will be XDR if you breathe it in from an XDR person. What, is that the last one? Yep, okay. So I'm going to go here in the striped shirt and then Richard. Uh, during uh, Colin's presentation, you she talked about... Closer, please. Uh, uh, during Colin's presentation, she talked about the World Health Organization producing a list of uh, priorities in 2018, and TB has been removed from the priority list. What's your comment? The, this is the, 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 the 2018 priority list for R&D. Okay, so yeah. the, this, was, this, is, look, this is politics, right? <laughs> so... No, no, I know all about this. Like, this is politics. This is, so there are, there are different worlds in, in, in law, I'm sure, and in medicine, and in, even just in, in infection, which I'm in, there are different worlds. And there are people who are really into stand, what we might call standard bacteria, these superbugs. They're in the hospitals. And there are people that are really into TB. And there aren't many people who are into both. So what actually happened was that group of people who were really into hospital stuff and don't really care for the TB people that much, they sat down and they came up with this list of R&D targets relating to their world. And they weren't really thinking about this world. This world heard about it, and they went crazy. And they were like, how can you only focus on your drug bugs in your hospitals and your patients and not think about our patients with TB? And um, Margaret Chan, I think, had a bit of humble pie and said, OK, I think maybe we better allow TB in. But these people weren't very happy about it, I can tell you, because I know these people. They weren't very happy that TB was lumped in with their illnesses. It's politics. People love their little fiefdoms. That's all it was. So actually, so that um, Tom was, re was referring to the priority list last year for antimicrobial resistance. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, that's what I was talking yep. about. The one that we were talking about earlier was the one that came out a few weeks ago, which is the 2018 priority list for uh, research and development. Right. And TB wasn't included on there either. So, yeah. I don't know so much about that one. Yeah. I'm sorry. But again, it's a similar story to what Tom said. <laughs> okay, so we'll go to Richard. Come back to Kumkwani. But, yep. Thanks. Two questions, one of which actually goes back to the question that was being asked before about uh, proving transmission. Uh, but the first question is, is there some cutoff level of bacteria in the sputum below which you would say, even though we're still picking it up, um, there is no real risk of onward transmission to another person if they were to come into contact with that sputum. Um, is there some cutoff point that we, that we know from the science? And I realize that might be a little bit tricky to come up with. And the second question is about the phylogenetic analysis piece. Um, we, I think, understand reasonably well in the HIV context that while phylogenetic analysis can establish degree of relation between the virus within two people, it can't establish direction or timing of transmission per se. In combination with other evidence in the facts of a particular case, you might be able to then draw some conclusions potentially to the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt to establish that person A was the source of person B's infection. But uh, in the absence of having that other evidence, it's hard to draw that conclusion specifically from the fact that person A and person B have a virus that is closely related. Would we not be able to apply the same logic to TB? And so, for example, would we, without further evidence, not be in a position to rule out that some third party might have been the source of, so, you know, A infected B and then B infected C as opposed to A infecting C? Does that make sense? Is, yep. Am I understanding that? And is that something that's valid to say about TB as it is about HIV? I think it's essentially the same, to my understanding. Yeah, it's the same. There could be a third party infecting both people, or it could be one to the other, and you have to put them together. Um, like I said, I mean, I'll just put it out there. If I was the judge, I think in the cases that we just described, if you're living in a close community, close in a house with someone coughing up XDR-TB and you get something phylogenetically similar and you weren't sick before, to me, that's beyond reasonable doubt, but then I, I don't, I've never been in a courtroom in my life, so I don't know. Um, your first question is, is there an absolute cutoff? No, I don't think there is an absolute cutoff. I think there's a sliding scale. Um, from 3 plus 2 plus 1 plus smear negative, culture negative. Um, and there's a sliding scale, and it is very difficult to say not at all infectious. A lot of HIV patients, for reasons I didn't go into, actually are smear negative, and, and Colleen mentioned that, but they definitely do transmit. So, 
smear negative does transmit for sure, just less so. So I, I think the answer is until you're culture negative. You can't, if you're culture negative, even then the bugs are down to like one or two per mil. You can probably call that uninfectious. Otherwise, it's a sliding scale with no inflection point or something that you can draw a cutoff at. So we're going to take one last question from Facebook. And I'm so sorry to the two of you at that table, but he'll be here over lunch. Uh, Chipongata says, is there anything that a prisoner can do to mitigate, I imagine, TB, but they said HIV transmission in prison? Uh, so, t I mean, TB transmission, well, I, th I think if you understand the dynamics that, um, of what transmission is, there's very little probably as a prisoner you can do, unless you could maybe get hold of a mask. I think anything I can really think of. I mean, you don't, have a, you don't have a chance to ventilate your room. You don't have a chance to stay away from other people that are coughing. These are out, out beyond your control. So I think there's very little you can do as a prisoner. I think if I was thrown into prison, I would struggle to protect myself from TB. The only thing that springs to mind is I would try and get hold of a mask and, and wear it. But, you know, very, very difficult. And that's the problem. But this is where the lawyers can come in because you can advocate for um, the appropriate measures to be in place in a prison. So, you know, we're talking about ventilation, we're talking about more space, but we're also talking about preventive therapy which we, we didn't talk about too much. But for people living with HIV who have a higher <coughs> risk factors of, of, uh, of acquiring active TB disease, then there is preventive therapy available. Um, and so those are some of the things that we also need to think about is like, what can we do in a prison? Maybe not the individual prisoner, but in the prison, in the institution, that we can actually uh, prevent TB from being spread. So I want to say thank you so much to Tom and to Tim and to all the questions. I think they were excellent, and I could see many more hands coming up. So I hope you do get to um, have some lunch with Tom, and uh, thank you so much. Pleasure.